You're welcome. You guys have to be quiet out there. Shut the door. Very briefly, Live Eight, uh, the new album, obviously. A couple of general lifestyle questions. The Year okay. Music Awards. And a One more thing, if, I, if, I, if you'd be kind enough just to use the question in your answer so that we can excerpt it for any international channel. Okay. Okay. Uh, the last time we saw you uh, was your amazing performance at Live Eight. How was that for you? And in retrospect, did the concert do, what did the concert do to help the African cause, do you think? Well, Performing in Live Eight was probably one of the most exciting things I've ever done in terms of um, being on the stage and being in front of an audience. Um, it was, uh, I think, the the energy, the feeling of love and sense of community that everybody had, not only the performers but the people in the audience, was um, amazing. And I've never had that experience before. And uh, I never had the feeling so much that there were so many people united for, 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 a, for the right reason, not just for the sake of entertainment. Um, and it was, a, it was a, a privilege for me to be involved with it. Uh, and I think, well, as far as I know, um, because of that concert, it did um, change the situation in Africa uh, and did have an influence on the lawmakers and the G8 summit that happened a few days afterwards. Okay, you spent so much publicized time uh, recently in New York. Mm -hmm. um, what was the most difficult for you? Was it getting on a horse to ride the streets with Letterman? Mm -hmm. Was it DJing new tracks in a club? Or was it giving, lecture, uh, giving a lecture to students? The hardest thing uh, for me during my promotional tour in New York was getting on a horse in my high heels and my very tight pants. Uh, it was a huge challenge. I was dared to do it in front of millions of people and of course I couldn't say no because then I would come off like I was a coward or something. Um, so I did it and that was hard for me. The lecture I did for the students was fun. I loved showing my movie to um, students at a college and then hearing their questions afterwards. And even more fun was DJing in a nightclub with Stuart. That was just a blast. You do that in London for us, if you want. I'd love to. Um, Junior Sanchez has called Confessions on the Dance Floor young, refreshing, and cutting edge. How do you describe the album in your own words? Well, first of all, I love Junior Sanchez for saying that. <laughs> um, did you say, what did you say? Young, cutting edge, and refreshing. what? Refreshing. Um, I think that's a good, a, a good way to describe the record. I, I, I mean, for me, I wanted to make a record that people put on and felt um, compelled to get up and dance to and sh couldn't control themselves. So that's, you know, that was my intention and hopefully I, su I succeeded. And where did you first meet producer uh, Stuart Price? Was it on the 2002 Drowned? I, I met Stuart Price when I was looking for a keyboard player for my Drowned World Tour. Actually, Mirwes suggested him to me. He uh, played a, a record that he had uh, made called Jacques Lecant, and I loved it. And I was told that he was very cheeky and uh, talented, and I said, bring him on. So he came to play keyboards for me, and then I fired my musical director, uh, and then Stuart stepped up to the plate, and he became my musical director, and then since then we've just been writing songs together and collaborating on stuff and um, it's been a great musical relationship. So what was the biggest challenge for you both when you were making the album? The biggest challenge for me when I was working with Stuart was not falling asleep on the couch because he's got a really comfy couch in the studio and I was very tired from editing my film so I would come to his loft where the studio is and I would lay down on it to like write my lyrics and he'd start playing music and I when I focus on music I, it actually puts me in a trance so I was very tired and I had to keep sort of I could I had, suddenly Stuart would be standing over me going wake up so um, uh, and the other part was actually trying to remember that we were working because we had so much fun together and what did Benny Bjorn think of the finished track uh, I got 
Well, I think Benny and Bjorn were very happy about the song Hung Up because I don't think they would have allowed me to sample their, their song if, if they hadn't liked it. On the last album, American Life, you had a political message to it, and some criticised you for being um, so overtly political. But this time around, you've returned to make um, an upbeat dance album. Do you think that artists like yourself can make political change through music, and do you have hope in politics? Um, I think that uh, anyone who's a, um, in the public eye, uh, anyone who's uh, a celebrity has the ability to make change in the world and to affect change in the world and I think ultimately that's the reason we are famous ultimately in the first place. I think that's why we're given the gift to reach, pe reach people. Um, I think we have a responsibility. Um, I don't think that it's something that you come to right away. I think it's something that you figure out as you go along and you educate yourself. Uh, paying attention to what's going on in the world around you and I think the more you do pay attention to the world around you the more disparity you see between the people who don't have and the people who do and um, I think that it's you know it's our privilege and 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 our and our responsibility to, to make a difference I understand that sorry will be the next single uh, release from the album could you tell me why you chose that to be the, the, the next single release? Because I, I, well, my record company wants me to, to, to um, really, sorry, it's a sort of unanimous, everybody loves it the best. They've asked all the record companies all around the world, my managers, etc., etc. so I'm just complying. <laughs> uh, push, is that about your relationship with Dorothy? No, everyone thinks I wrote the song Push about my husband. I should just say yes and get it over with, and I won't have to give long explanations. Um, I, I didn't really write it about anyone in particular. I wrote it about several people, uh, sort of all the people in my life who've come through my life and inspired me and encouraged me to believe in my dreams. Which one song off the album, uh, if you were to put it on in your car while you're driving? Or at home, would you think, yeah, that's me, this is Madonna? The song that I most identify with uh, on my record is I Love New York. <laughs> um, moving on to your image, you wear a lot of different hats from uh, entertainer to mother to actress. I wear a lot of different shirts too. <laughs> Author to fashion icon. Which role gives you the most satisfaction? Which do you say the most? Well, that, it's hard to say which I, I, I prefer the most. I mean, I love being an entertainer. I love cr being creative. I love collaborating with, with people like Jamie King and Stuart Price and you know, all the people that I work with to create the things that I do. It gives me an enormous amount of pleasure, but of course I also love my children and interacting with them and my family, my family life. I, I suppose I, I couldn't live without either of them. So. And your documentary, tell us a little about your new documentary, I'm going to tell you a secret. Which side of Madonna does the documentary reveal? The, uh, my documentary, I'm going to tell you a secret, is, is, was uh, filmed while I was on tour last year. And to a certain extent, it's about my life on the road, it's about my relationship with the dancers and the band and the people that uh, I work with. Um, uh, it's about the trials and tribulations of putting a show together. It's about uh, my relationship with my family, my children, my husband, the struggle to balance my life as an entertainer with my life as a mother, and also it's about the world and my, my, my politics, my uh, belief systems, my, my philosophy, my, uh, about where I feel my place in the world is. So it kind of, it, 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 it um, it sort of circles around three families, the family of the people I work with, the family that I live with, and the family of man, the world that I live in. Uh, with Britney Spears, have you had any contact with Britney since she's become a, a mother? I read that you're organizing a, a, a Kabbalah blessing for the baby. No, that's completely false, so we don't have to repeat that one. <laughs> Uh, other than your uh, wonderful collection of children's books, is there um, any other authors or books that you recommend for parents to give to their young children? Hmm.
any authors or books that I recommend? Well, I, I, I do read a lot of books to my children, and every once in a while I'll come across one that I think is fantastic and amazing, but I have to say I don't remember the, name of, the names of the writers. Sorry about that. Would you be concerned if Lords or, or, or Rocker were to follow in your footsteps and uh, have a career in entertainment? I wouldn't be concerned as long as they were prepared and they, they were um, clear about their priorities and understood that, you know, first, you know, the, the, you know what is it that you want to say and what is it that you want to do? Um, um, I started off as a dancer and then I became a singer and a songwriter. Um, I think it's good to start off in one area and be good at something and be focused and um, study and take it seriously. And then after that, you know, it can change and evolve into other areas. I think um, I would encourage my children to do anything that they wanted to do as long as um, they took it seriously. Moving on to the MTV Europe Music Awards, which of course you're performing on this year. Mm -hmm. What's, can you talk us through your memories of the, uh, of the ELAs? Your memories of the Europe Music Awards and the previous appearances that you've made there? In Europe? Yeah. Oh, someone's going to have to remind me. I don't remember anything. Kylie Minogue t-shirt in the suite. Kylie Minogue t-shirt, so that was the music era? That ran a lot of music. You know what year it was? 2000. It was music. Okay, but I don't remember it, so <laughs> sorry. Um. <laughs> <laughs> I remember the party afterwards. That's all I remember. <laughs> well, tell us about the party. Uh uh. <laughs> Artists, uh, what, what, what are your impressions of Lisbon? Uh, were you, you perform there? Do you like? Uh, I I love Lisbon. It's one of my favorite cities. Um, um, I went. I was there. It was actually the last uh, city I performed in on my tour last year, and it was a great place to end my tour. The audiences were amazing. The city itself is architecturally gorgeous, and I stayed in one of my favorite hotels in the world. So, and I'm looking forward to going back there. <laughs> if you could give a special year of music award uh, for the best music news story of the year so far, what would it be, uh, and who would receive it? For instance, Live Aid or Britney. The best music news story? Mm, mm, I don't really pay too much attention to music news. You want to give me a clue? Huh? Madonna's new album. Yes, I would say that Madonna's new record is, is um, brilliant. Music news. <laughs> How do you think Borat will uh, cope with presenting the show this year? Is he a good choice? Do you like him? Borat? Oh, he rocks. I love him. <laughs> <laughs> I've got another two hours of questions, but I guess that's it. That's it. Oh, you don't, don't you all? Madonna, welcome to CD UK. Thank you very much for coming on the show. My pleasure. Now, first things first, we all know that recently you had a bit of a nasty equine accident. Mm -hmm. How's the arm? How are you feeling? I'm almost 100%. I've got um, a little bit of a crack still in my scapula and in my one of my ribs. So um, no one should hug me tight. Right. But I'm okay. I've started dancing again and I'm starting to do rehab and uh, pretty soon I'll be able to give people some really nice slaps. So they better watch out. <laughs> oh, good. Well, it's good. it's good to hear that you're healing well. I am. What happened, can I ask, to the horse? Was he severely punished? No, he wasn't my horse. And uh, I think he got sent back to the estate he came from. Yeah, exactly. Very naughty thing. Not welcome. No. no. No plus one for him at the next party. No. Now recently, you were voted number 10 in Country Life's list of people who wield the most power in the English countryside. Pretty number cool, Number 10? Huh? Num I know, well, yeah, exactly. That's, well, I think that, you know, one to nine were all like royals, so. Toffs. <laughs> yeah. I guess that's impressive. It's pretty that's, cool. That's a list I never thought I'd make. Well, exactly. Do you think there's anything you'd like to use your newfound power to change about the countryside? Um, well, I'd like to punish that horse that threw me, number one. 
He's glue. That yeah. should be no problem. Exactly. And they should restore more of the old pubs back to their natural state. Don't modernize them. No. Keep them very quaint and charming and oldie worldy. Slightly damp, welly smell. Yes, and I think there should be more Timothy Taylor av available in all pubs in, in the countryside and in London. Is that, a, yeah. is that a specific type of ale? Yeah. Right, I haven't sampled Timothy Taylor. Is it delicious? It's delicious. Really? Yeah. Note to self. Okay, write that down. Yeah, I will. <laughs> in there. <laughs> Uh, now, recently, you were pictured on the cover of Vogue feeding chickens in the grounds of your estate. Were yep. they your chickens or had, had they strayed? They're my them? chickens. Uh, we have 21 chickens. They, lots, they lay lots of yummy eggs. Um, I don't usually feed them in my high heels. No. Um, so, uh, but they're my chickens, yes. <laughs> Do you name your beasts, like the animals that you've got on your farm? No. Chick, chick, chick. Yeah. Chick one, chick two, and chick three. Uh -uh. You think when your brain's that small, there's not a lot of points. <laughs> well, my daughter doesn't think that of her hamster. Um, but uh, no, we haven't named the chickens. No gaps, no ballads, put on your dancing shoes. Because I'm in the mood to dance. The album, of course, is called uh, Confessions on a Dance Floor. Mm -hmm. And you've, you've gone back to your roots and just made a completely you know, fall to the floor, unapologetic disco album. Yep. Why now? Because I'm in the mood to dance. That's really the plain and simple. And there um, are no gaps in this record. No it gaps. Goes song to song to song to song. No ballads. Put on your dancing shoes. So do you get to go clubbing much these days? I have been lately because I've been going to clubs to promote my record. So I got to go dancing at the Roxy. Um, I actually had my daughter's birthday party at the Roxy as well. When it, you know, it's a roller skating rink, so that was fun. We played disco music for the entire party, and uh, I DJed one night in, a, in another club in New York. Cool. So, so you can probably have you always been able to do that? Or is that quite a recent? Um, I used to do it back in the day because I used to go out with DJs. My first boyfriend in New York was a DJ. He used to teach me some of his tricks, and I would go into the DJ booth and like do stuff. Like the crab scratch, bit of yeah. crossfader action. Yeah, exactly. And uh, speaking of, of your daughter, we hear that Lourdes is going to be uh, ballet dancing in the Nutcracker yeah. in London soon. So obviously she's inherited your, your funky dance moves. Well, I'm not sure how funky she'll be dancing. But well, probably not in the Nutcracker. She's not. a good dancer. Um, she's actually a way better ballet dancer than I was. Right. Um, but uh, I'm very excited about it, and I know she is. And I heard that you disco dance with both the kids for an hour before bedtime every night. Not every night. If I get, I've got to get like, for instance, tonight. You know. You might but, miss them. Yeah. Yeah, but that is something I love to do. They both love to dance, and it's a good way to tire them out. Exactly. I was going to say that's Perfect. what a brilliant idea. We play disco tag. How do you play disco tag? We put on a disco song, and then there's this thing, this robot that's in the middle of the floor. You you have to hold on to the the, the robot. Yeah. Uh, or you get tagged. Uh, when the music turns off, I mean, it's it's long and complicated. It's complicated. It involves music and it involves dancing. And a robot. And I just like the idea that you said there's a robot in the room, right? So a yes. game anyone can play then. Yeah. Like that. Yeah. <laughs> now, last time we spoke to you on CD UK, the kids were listening to the Sugar Babes. Has that changed now? Are they. Um, well, same? Lola's really into um, Rachel Stevens, Beyonce. She likes Gwen Stefani. I think that's her favourite stuff, and my son listens uh, to Usher. Yeah, it's yeah. his favourite. Smooth. He's going to yeah, be smooth. He's a, yeah, he's a smooth operator, my son. And what about you? What are you listening to now? Gold Frat. I love their new record. Well, a lot of people are saying, it, you it's know, cool. that, it, that it's very much Alison's a, a lot like you. you. Really? Yeah, kind of. I think a lot oh, of people I think are so saying. At all. It's good. Well, it's good. It's different. It? It's good. Uh, so the single, Hung Up, samples Gimme 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 by right. ABBA. Have you always been an ABBA fan? Yep, always. And, and in fact, I had to work hard. I had to do backbends to get them to let me use the sample. Really? Who imagine. was it? Was it was it Bjorn being tricky? Well, there's a, a tricky one and a non-tricky one. Right, OK. And I'm not sure which one it is, to tell you the truth. That's fair. I think everybody has that with ABBA. Um, now, I'm told, I don't know if this is true either, that you're right into the Mamma Mia stage show. Is that true? Is that, what? The Mamma Mia stage show, ABBA the musical. 
Well, I, I haven't seen it yet. I haven't seen it either. No, I haven't seen They said in the papers you've been to see it hundreds of times. Liars, right. <laughs> They're on the list. I, I'd like, is it good? I'd like to see it. I haven't seen it yet. Oh, okay. I was going to ask you. I, was, I still want to see, I want to say, hey, I want to go see Billy Elliot. Is yeah. That, is that good? A young northern boy doing ballet warms my heart being from the <laughs> northeast. <laughs> introduced myself to Ricky Gervais at Live 8 and he asked me who I was. He was just being cheeky though. No, I don't think he's ever yeah, heard of me. No, he's so into himself, he's never heard of me. You're somebody that everybody knows. You're kind of, there's probably... That, that's a song title. Well, you can have it, it's yours. Okay. Is it an actual song title yet? Or no, you're one? somebody that everybody knows. Well, Write that down. take it, it's yours. It's Thank yours, you. Madonna. Thank you. Um, and you're kind of like a part of the fabric of everybody's life. Do you ever miss being able to introduce yourself to people? Well, every once in a while it happens. Really? Well, yeah, well, I introduced myself to Ricky Gervais at Live 8 and he asked me who I was. He was just being cheeky, though. No, I don't think he's ever yeah, heard of me. No, he's, he's so into himself, he's never heard of me. <laughs> you know what, I can't remember exactly, but every once in a while I'll be somewhere and someone, generally it's an older person, will say, what's your name, honey? It's very sweet. That must be quite nice. It I must love be quite it. a nice change. Yeah, yeah, it's cool. So on the subject of Ricky, are you going to be in the new series of Extras? We've got our fingers crossed. I li I'd like to be. Who, would like you like to play yourself for? He's going to have to be nicer to me the next time he sees me. Though. Ricky? He's um, been warned. Mm -hmm. Consider yourself warned, Gervais. And also on the subject of being recognised, where are people best at pretending not to recognise you out of politeness? Well, that would be just about everywhere. Um, not Oxford Street. Do, do they just shout then? Well, no, at Oxford Street they do this. They walk past you and then they turn around. I call them U-turns. And they go this way and then right when they're like 20 feet away from you, they turn around and come at you again. I don't know. I mean, when I go to pubs, everybody leaves me alone. Yeah. That's probably why I like going there. Finally, is it true that you turned down £82 million to star in your own Las Vegas show? And if so, was it the Siegfried and Roy situation that put you off? You know, what happened to Roy? Well, I don't work with animals, so... <laughs> you wouldn't bring in a panther for Vegas? No, no, no. So I wouldn't, I wouldn't, that wouldn't put me off of it. I think I just don't like the idea of being stuck in one city for so many months. Mm. That would be the, a challenge I couldn't... Uh, Put myself up for. So it wasn't the so. 82 million that you poo pooed, it was just no. being stuck in the desert. It wasn't the money that freaked me out, it wasn't the animals, yeah, it was the sand. <laughs> and I think that's a, that's as good a way to end it, Zenny. Thank you very much for, You're for joining us. Here's the official sneak peek of my new movie, I'm Going to Tell You a Secret, on V Spot. So you got this uh, film. Oh, <laughs> I'm gonna keep it right here. Uh, I got this film. You got this film, Colin. I'm gonna tell you a secret, uh -huh. which some people are calling a uh, sequel to uh, Truth or Dare. Yeah, it's one way to look at it. Or is it a variation on a theme? What's the difference? Well, the difference is is that it's not quite the sequel. It's like it's not like. Well, it's still me. Yes. On the road, on tour, behind the scenes, I tell the truth. I dare to tell the truth. Right. And I'm going to tell you a secret is me 12 years later, essentially doing the same thing. Very provocative title, too. I'm going to tell you a secret? Mm -hmm. Cool. So is Truth or Dare. Truth or Dare is a game. Yeah? Yeah. But it's not, I mean, I'm Life tell is you. a game. Yeah, it is. The notion of uh, reinvention, I mean, because it follows you on your reinvention tour. Mm -hmm. um, what people know of you for the majority of your career is that it's been a physical or a musical reinvention. This, seem, this phase of your life seems to represent a spiritual re reinvention. Is that accurate? And if so, why did it come about? Well, I called the tour reinvention because it was essentially me looking back at the last 20 years of my life uh, as, as a recording artist and um, taking everything that I'd done in the past and reinventing it, um, presenting it in a new and different way and looking to the future and seeing no limitations. So you could say that it's spiritual or cosmic or emotional or metaphysical or all of the above. I do change physically, but hopefully I change mentally, emotionally, intellectually, all of those things. And I think that's what life's about, evolving and changing. And that's why I call the tour that. 
There was a good quote in, in uh, an article written about you and Vanity Fair a couple of years ago where it said, your image has taken a back seat to your life. Is that a fair representation right now? My image your... has taken a back I don't know. Don't you like my weenie rolls? I love your weenie rolls. Okay. But it seems to be it seems to be less about not that the other images the, the other personas well, were forced, but well, I just think that my life is a lot more informed by my by by my children and and my, and my fa my family life. So people are paying attention to other aspects of me, and and those things are informing my work. So I think it's just all getting mixed up. It's it's expanding. It's growing. I'm growing. Hopefully. You have this new record, yeah. Confessions on a Dance Floor, yeah. Which uh, the early buzz said that it was going to go back to your '80s roots. Um, was that is that the approach? Is that the approach you no. had going? Well, well, I wanted to go back to the dance floor mm. and the disco, and because that's how I started. I started with dance music, and dancing is my was my first love, and that's why I came to New York in the first place to be a dancer. Right. So I guess I wanted to. Get into that and celebrate that. And I, you know, remember the first time I ever walked into a disco in Detroit, Michigan, and it was a very memorable and euphoric experience for me. Um, so, just it was an homage to all of those things. What was the music playing when you walked into that disco? What kind of music was playing? Um, oh God, I don't remember. I don't remember. It could have been, you know, that song uh, "Disco Inferno." Right. Dun, 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 dun. You know that song? Burn, baby, burn. Yeah, you got it. Disco Inferno. Mm -hmm. Taken from the film. Mm -hmm. Saturday, Saturday Fever. Fever. Which inspired, look at the segues. Hung up. Are you keeping track of the segues? This is crazy. Of, uh, of your, hung up. <laughs> of your hung up video, yeah. yeah. Talk a little bit about that. Uh, the video? Mm -hmm. Okay, well, um, I always have to have a reference point, something to jump off of, something that inspires me every time I make a video. Right. So Saturday Night Fever was that, that was my muse. So to speak, John Travolta, I channeled him. Mm -hmm. I, you know, I love him so much in that movie. I think he, he's just so full of life. And I, I love the way he moves. I love the innocence and naivety of it. And I just, you know, it just really excited me. And, and I hadn't seen it in years. And so me and Jamie, um, the choreographer, watched it a gazillion times. And, yeah, like straight? You watch it 20 times straight or something no, like that? No, no, no. We watched it and we chat about it right. and we give it to the director and then we watch it again and we chat about it and then we go to the key scenes. It's like a coach breaking down game film or something exactly. like that. Exactly. Dance moves, hairstyles, clothes. The, the suit, the white suit? Lip gloss. Does it make an appearance? No, no white suits, uh, but weenie rolls. Okay. The weenie rolls coming back. Yeah. Courtesy Madonna. How did you get uh, the, the, the guys from ABBA, the guys and gals, I guess, from ABBA to, to give you the sample? It was Benny and Bjorn yeah. that we went to. Oh, well, I wrote them a letter. Um, we played them the song. I mean, I hopefully I conveyed to them that my respect and admiration for everything they've done, um, their music seriously inspired this record, but right. I've always loved their records. And I think the clincher was that they liked the song. <laughs> And of all their songs in their catalog, why Gimme, Gimme, Gimme? Because it's got a killer hook in it. Why not? One of the tracks on the record has caused a bit of a stir. Really? Uh, uh, Isaac, isn't that the song that's causing a bit of a, yeah. a, a bit of controversy right now? So I've been told. So you've been told. Um, what have you been told specifically? I'm told that people think it's a song about Isaac Luria, right. which it's not. Oh, okay. At all. So where did they get that? They just made it up, oh, okay. like most things. Right. It's called Isaac because the singer who sings on it is named Isaac. And I couldn't think of a name for the song, so I called it Isaac. It's as simple as that. Because right. there was this uh, fuel roar, if you will, or I know, but these are people who never heard the record because the record's not out yet. So how do they know what the song's about? You're going to a point where you're really letting the philosophy of what you've sort of come to embrace in the last couple of years come out. It's not just about going out and having a good time. And yeah, but that's a good thing to do too. True, true enough, but it was interesting when you said that uh, the only thing that's going to change the world is spirituality and not politics. Mm -hmm. why, why do you think that, that, that politics has become such a problem for us? I mean, some may say throughout the ages since we decided to have organized because, because there's too many um, gods to serve, you know what I mean? A politician has to make so many people happy that he ultimately ends up alienating a lot of people and a lot of 
groups or people end up suffering. It's the nature of the beast. But how do you get that message across to somebody who, you know, is just trying to scrape out a, a living, just dealing with what we've seen in the last little while, natural disasters where, all right, you know, I've got to really get in touch with myself where all they're worried about is finding a place to sleep. And survival. Yeah. yeah. Well, first you do have to take care of those things. Right. Survival. Take care of your, your family, your own health, your own safety. Um, how you're going to live, how you're going to eat, where you're going to sleep, those are, you know, number one priority. But, I'm, you know, I'm addressing people who are not in those uh, life-threatening situations. And there are a lot of people who live very comfortable lives who can afford to step back and say, okay, what am I doing to help other people? What am I doing with my life? How am I make, what am I doing to make the world a better place? And, you know, you don't have to, you know, go to Africa um, and, you know, you know, join the uh, Peace Corps. the Peace Corps. I mean, you can make the world a better place by improving your relationship with your family or your children or your parents or whatever. Again, it's a tough message to, to get across to someone who's, I mean, you talk about how difficult it is to balance life and work and yeah. thankfully you're you're in a position to have a, a good support system to, to allow you to do that. Yeah. Most people don't. Most people are their own driver, their own cook, their bottle washer, yeah, whatever. Yeah, but that doesn't mean that I, I have the same challenges. I still have to, you know, I still have the obligation and, and I want to, it's not an obligation, but, you know, I still have children that need me around. I still have responsibilities um, because of the choices I've made and, I, you know, my struggles are not exactly the same as other people's, but when you get right down to it, it is. I do believe that a person who has achieved a lot, who's looked at life from both sides who has had the benefit of you know fame and fortune is in a very good position to say you know what it doesn't mean what everybody thinks it means right. um, who better to say that than somebody who has achieved those things because we live in a society that you know encourages people to have that as their main and only goal right. to you know be rich and successful or famous it's kind of what you refer to as the beast right the material yeah. world yeah which is interesting coming from someone who was talking about singing about that many, many yes years but that ago. was ironic it was indeed. <laughs> you said it, you've always felt it was your job to wake people up, to give them tools and direction, otherwise they'll fall back asleep. What kind of tools and direction are you talking about? Well, to first of all, I have to practice what I preach. Right. I can't just talk the talk, I have to walk the walk. And that's, that's the biggest thing. And one of my biggest things that I try to impart to people is that, you know, it starts with yourself. It starts with, take, with taking responsibility for yourself for your words, for your actions, and um, that's a tool right there. Because right. as soon as you start thinking, okay, everything I say is going to come back to me and everything I do is going to come back to me, that puts a whole new spin on everything. And you want to inspire people to be better versions of themselves. Again, yeah. how do you expect well, That's to... a play on the whole reinvention thing. Right. And you know, we were all, we all came to this world to achieve something and to and to do something, something special. And so the idea is, you know, are you figuring out what that is? Are you getting close to that? Do you think you've reached your potential? Are you doing everything you think you can do? Why do you think it's... Are you? Oh, you're asking, you're not being rhetorical. Both. Mm, uh, no, but that's a good, yeah. it's a good question to, right. to ask and to be asked. Have you had people uh, come up to you, uh, whether in the streets or, or, you know, just when you're when you're making your way in the world? I don't know how you're able to interact with a lot of people because, again, the nature of the beast of of your of your success of your celebrity is that you have to insulate yourself a little bit. Yeah. But have you had responses from people saying, you know, thanks? That was it. Sort of turned on a light or a switch in my head to to, to make me think about the, those things, and and I have started to 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 look inward as much as outward. I have. People do come up to me and say that, or write me letters, or whatever, yeah. What has been the most, say, rewarding response that you've received from someone, um, or, or most most memorable in, in, along those lines? I get a lot of people just saying, you know, you changed my life, you mm -hmm. you made me look at life in a different way, and that's really, if, if I do that for people, then I feel like I've accomplished a lot. Talk a little bit about that for those of us who hadn't had an opportunity to, to, to see the show in terms of what goes into putting, uh, you know... Show together? Yes. <sighs> Where to begin? Um, With Jamie King, I think. Yeah, yeah. Jamie King, yeah. It, well, for, I have to find a director and I have to find a musical director. And I was very privileged to have Stuart and Jamie as my uh, co-pilots. Um, and I think working on the music 
at, at, at the same time as like you know putting together how the show is going to evolve and what it's going to look like I mean they 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 play off of each other and as the music changes the staging changes and the staging changes and the music changes and it's just this another beast right that begins to grow yeah um, what there's a moment there are a couple of moments in in, in, in the, the the documentary and that's the, the stage show where it gets quite heavy I mean maybe something that a lot of your fans uh, weren't expecting especially when you perform American life mm -hmm. uh, talk a little bit about that in terms of what I mean, it's obvious the message that you're trying to, to get across, but why you felt it was important to, to use your stage as, as, as you did, as a, for lack of a better word, a soapbox in, in, in some respects. Mm -hmm. I wanted to show the, the reality of war, mm. the, um, the tragedy of war, um, the suffering and the heartache. And, you know, war isn't something that happens over there, you know? It happens to people like you and me, children and mothers and, and um, it's very real, and it's part of our life. It's become part of our life now. Right. And I, you know, obviously I don't want it to happen. I'm against it. And sometimes you have to shove it in people's faces. That's the question. Is it the responsibility of yourself or Green Day or U2 or Pearl Jam to, to get that message out there to, to people who basically come in to be entertained? You know? Yeah, but I think people were entertained too. I think it's, you know, it's what I choose to do. Um, you know, I could just put on an entertaining show, but then people are going to leave and they're going to forget about it. The variation of the theme that I was thinking of earlier in terms of this versus or, or t picking up from where tr Truth or Dare may, made a, may have left off is that it's not about your work family anymore. It's about your biological, your... your, your... Well, it's about both of my families. Right, correct. And I found that entertaining too. In fact, there was a bit there between uh, Lola, if I may call her that, a nickname. Of course. Lola and Rocco uh -huh. uh, interacting. Mm -hmm. And I was like, this is the mini v me version of you and Guy. Is that, is that accurate? Kind of. Yeah? Yeah. Why did you uh, feel that it was, it was necessary or, or, or you wanted it to be a part of the documentary to show that side of your life? Where, where a lot of celebrities and a lot of people in your position would say, no, that's where we draw the line. If I'm going to make a documentary about me, my life, and I'm going to share my beliefs with people, I think people need to see me as a human being. I think my children and my husband and my family life are a big part of my life. They inform a lot of what I do. And I think it would have been a mistake and a lie to leave that out. I also feel that it, uh, it, I wanted to show the struggle between, you know, my work life and my family life because right. it is a struggle, and I think a lot of people who work and have families can relate to that. If you write a book on relationships, yeah. it should be called "If You Found Your Soul." If you think you found your soulmate, run in the opposite direction. I no, love if you think you found someone who's perfect, then run in the opposite. What? Because if someone's perfect, they're not going to challenge you. If someone's perfect, they're not going to make you grow. I mean, and you're going to get bored of them, and it's not going to last, so why bother? The documentary starts off where you and uh, your uh, producer, Stuart Price, are, are collaborating. Uh, but it, it's more on, on the, the, the music that you're, that you're working on. As far yeah. as lyrics are concerned, what's yeah. your writing process like? How do you do that? It's all different. Um, sometimes I hear music, and it inspires lyrics. Sometimes I write stuff and I bring it to Stuart and we and I sing a melody to him and he puts music behind it. I could read a newspaper article and see a phrase and go, oh, that is dope. I got to put that in a song. So right. it's, it's all different. Uh, there's a line in Hung Up that talks about time goes by so slowly for those who wait, no time to hesitate. Those who, who run seem to have all the fun. I'm caught up. I don't know what to do. Who's on the run, Madonna? And who's having fun? That's the question. That's a very good question. Yeah. The whole world's on the run. Yeah. I'm not sure they're having fun. But I'm having fun. <laughs> yeah. I mean, that's, that, that's about not letting time waste and seizing the moment and going for it. What did you mean by the line, I'm caught up, uh, but I don't know what to do? Oh, I don't know. I just threw that in there. It doesn't mean anything. <laughs> How much? Sounds good. Yeah, it does. <laughs> it rhymes. Well, that's the thing. I mean, as a fan of your music or just music in general, you sit down and you just break down these lyrics. You know, yeah. Uh, Best not to do that. No. I mean, they're, 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 you know, sometimes you can take them literally and sometimes they're very abstract. I mean, hung up is about seizing the moment. But if you, if you get into the chorus, lyrics in the chorus, it sounds like a, I'm a spurned lover right. or, you know, I'm tired of waiting around yeah. for this person. And, you know, but it's, it's, it's a love song about life. 
and not wanting to wait, wanting to seize the moment. How much does your uh, spirituality affect or influence your writing as well? You were talking about reading the newspaper and getting inspiration or, mm -hmm. or anything that happens in your life. But what about right. your actual uh, belief system, your, your, your uh, thought, you know, your spirituality in mm -hmm. terms of Kabbalah? Yeah. Um, well, I think it inspires me. I think it informs me. I, I think that I, um, I get things from it that I mean, it definitely inspires my, my songwriting. In what way, though, specifically? Phrases come to mind. Um, ideas come to mind. And, you know, even a song like Let It Will Be, which is, you know, essentially about looking at fame and, right. and fortune and saying, now I can tell you about success, about fame, right. about the rise and fall of all the stars in the sky. I mean, it's all about, it's about asking questions. I mean. The whole point of me studying or whatever is just I got to a certain place in my life and I said, is that is that all there is, right. you know? So it makes me ask questions mm -hmm. and those questions provoke ideas and thoughts and, and music. I was surprised to hear it as a as an elect that, that this new record was going to be uh, as electronic sounding as it is, considering you learned to play guitar over the last couple of years. Yeah. The documentary has you playing guitar. I yeah. thought for some reason that the next logical step for you, the progression. Folk music? No, not folk music. Uh -huh. uh, a little Green Day influence, perhaps. You know, a little, little garage hey, rock. Hey, I rock out on I Love New York. Yeah, you do. Yeah. But it's it, it, but it's predominantly But it's electronic. good to keep you guessing. So yeah. Every time you think I'm going to do something, I do something else. And Stuart, uh, your producer, basically road tested some of the songs already, right? Yeah. Being the. Uh, inimitable DJ that he is he uh, yeah he got to go out I, I feel very privileged that he got to do that go out to uh, clubs where he was spinning and you know sneak in a dub mix or something and see how people reacted to it and if they reacted great you know focusing on the strengths and like going okay that part wasn't so good let's get rid of that part we need to work on that mm -hmm. or some songs didn't work at all and didn't use those what do you uh, want to do next like do you want to go on the road do you want to Put out another record, go back um, to the studio. Put out another record, dude. I just put out a record. No, 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 no. But some people just race back into. No. Did you just call me dude, by the way? I did. Come on. Sorry, I'm from Michigan. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but I mean, no, but like, do you want to, like, a band like REM went through a, a, a phase where they just kept going back into the studio? Oh, no. I don't really like the studio too much. It's right. lonely. Lonely. I don't like to sit still. So, what I want to do next is probably. Probably go on tour. Um, I've got lots of plans for myself, as you could imagine. That's one of them. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Any others you want to share? Um, I'd love to direct a film. Ah. Mm -hmm. Eureka! People are starring that right now. Man. This is a news break. <laughs> <laughs> do you have a project in mind, or? I do. Yeah. A few. Anything you want to talk about? Nope. <laughs> All right. Are you gonna get? Uh, Pointers, tips from any directors you might know? Well, I'm married to a director. Oh, really? Yes. Oh, really? Now I know you are, but have you talked to him and consulted with him? On... No. And will you? <laughs> nope. <laughs> no, I don't. I mean, listen, I talk to him about all the time about what he's working on. I learned from, from watching him, but I've made a lot of films, and and uh, I have a lot of very good friends who are directors. So. Well, thank you very much for spending time with us. My pleasure. Lovely of you to drop by. Yeah. And congratulations on the album and the thank documentary. You. Thank you. Pleasure.